My name's Kip. This is me. I had a cliche U.S. American childhood. My mom was a teacher, my dad was in the military, and I have one sister. I played all the sports growing up, but I always loved the outdoors and camping. Life was simple, not a care in the world. And then this guy showed up. Like so many of us, I saw his film An Inconvenient Truth about the impacts of global warming, and it scared the emojis out of me. In Al Gore's film, he describes how our Earth is in peril. Climate change stands to affect all life on this planet. From monster storms, raging wildfires, record droughts, ice caps melting, acidification of the oceans to entire countries going underwater, that could all be caused by humans' demands on the Earth. I wanted to do everything I could to help. I made up my mind right then and there to change how I lived and to do whatever I possibly could to find a way for all of us to live together, in balance with the planet, sustainably, forever. I started to do all the things Al told us to do. I became an OCE, Obsessive Compulsive Environmentalist. I separated the trash and recycling. I composted, changed all the light bulbs, took short showers, turned the water off when I brushed my teeth, turned off lights when leaving a room, and rode my bike instead of driving everywhere. But as the years went by, it seemed as if things were getting worse. I had to wonder, with all the continuing ecological crisis facing the planet, even if every single one of us adopted these conservation habits, was this really gonna be enough to save the world? It just seemed that there was something more to the story. I thought I was doing everything I could to help the planet. But then, with one friend's post, everything changed. The Post sent me to a report online published by the United Nations stating that raising livestock produces more greenhouse gases than the emissions of the entire transportation sector. This means that the meat and dairy industry produces more greenhouse gases than the exhaust of all cars, trucks, trains, boats, planes combined. Cows and other farmed animals produce a substantial amount of methane from their digestive process. Methane gas from livestock is 86 times more destructive than carbon dioxide from vehicles. But it turns out there's more to climate change than just fossil fuels. I started doing more research. The UN, along with other agencies, reported that not only did livestock play a major role in global warming, it is also the leading cause of resource consumption and environmental degradation destroying the planet today. How is it possible I wasn't aware of this? I thought this information would be plastered everywhere in the environmental community. It seemed the main focus for many of these groups was natural gas and oil production, with fracking being the latest hot issue due to water usage and contamination. Hydraulic fracturing for natural gas uses an incredible amount of water. A staggering 100 billion gallons of water is used every year in the United States. But when I compared this with animal agriculture, raising livestock just in the U.S. consumes 34 trillion gallons of water. And it turns out the methane emissions from both industries are nearly equal. Living in California, a state plagued by drought and water shortages, water use is a major concern for many of us. The average Californian uses about 1,500 gallons per person per day. Um, about half of that is related to the consumption of meat and dairy products. So meat and dairy products are incredibly water intensive, um, in part because the animals are using very water intensive grains. That's what they, they eat. Um, and so all of the water embedded in, in the grain and that the animal eats essentially is, is considered part of the virtual water footprint of that product. I found out that one quarter pound hamburger requires over 660 gallons of water to produce. Here I've been taking these short showers trying to save water and to find out just eating one hamburger is the equivalent of showering two entire months. So much attention is given to lowering our home water use, yet domestic water use is only 5% of what is consumed in the U.S. versus 55% for animal agriculture. That's because it takes upwards of 2,500 gallons of water to produce one pound of beef. I started doing more investigating on the impacts of livestock and found out the situation was actually worse than I had thought. The transportation and energy sectors are understandably given a lot of attention because of the terrible impact carbon dioxide is having on our climate. But animal agriculture produces 65% of the world's nitrous oxide, a gas with a global warming potential 296 times greater than CO2 per pound. Yet all we hear about is fossil fuels. Energy-related CO2 emissions are expected to increase 20% by the year 2040. Yet emissions from agriculture are predicted to increase 80% by 2050. This devastating figure is mostly due to a projected global increase in meat and dairy consumption. 
According to two environmental specialists at the World Bank Group, using the global standard for measuring greenhouse gases, concluded that animal agriculture was responsible for 51% of human-caused climate change when the loss of carbon sinks, respiration, and methane are properly accounted for, which the UN study failed to address. But not only that, I found out that raising animals for food is responsible for 30% of the world's water consumption, occupies up to 45% of the Earth's land, is responsible for up to 91% of Brazilian Amazon destruction, is a leading cause of ocean dead zones, habitat destruction, and species extinction. So my calculations are that without using any gas or oil or fuel ever again from this day forward, that we would still exceed our maximum carbon equivalent greenhouse gas emissions uh, the 565 gigatons by the year 2030. Without the electricity sector even, or energy sector even factored in the equation, all simply by eating, raising and eating livestock. If you reduce the amount of methane emissions, the level in the atmosphere go down, goes down fairly quickly and within decades, as opposed to CO2, if you reduce the emissions to the atmosphere, you don't really see a signal in the atmosphere for 100 years or so. It's an environmental disaster that's being ignored by the very people who should be championing. Deforestation, land use, water scarcity, the destabilization of communities, world hunger, the list doesn't stop. Free living animals made up, you know, 10,000 years ago, made up 99% of the biomass. And human beings, we only made up 1% of the biomass. Today, only 10,000 years later, which is really just a fraction of time, we human beings and the animals that we own as property make up 98% of the biomass, and wild, free-living animals make up only 2%. We've basically completely stolen the world, the earth, from free-living animals to use for ourselves and our cows and pigs and chickens and factory farm fish, and the oceans have been even more <laughs> devastated. Concerned researchers of the loss of species uh, agree that the primary cause of loss of species on our Earth that we're witnessing is due to overgrazing and habitat loss from livestock production on land and by overfishing, which I call fishing, in our oceans. And we're in the middle of the largest mass extinction of species in 65 million years. The rainforest is being cut down at the rate of an acre per second. And the driving force behind all of this is animal agriculture, cutting down the forests to graze animals and to grow soybeans. Uh, genetically engineered soybeans to feed to the cows and pigs and chickens and factory farm fish. 91% of the loss of rainforest in the Amazon area thus far to date, 91% that's been destroyed is due to raising livestock. The leading cause of environmental destruction is, is animal agriculture. Methane production from cows and other livestock's flatulence is a major contributor, but mostly it is due to deforestation and the waste they produce which is 130 times more waste than the entire human population, virtually all without the benefit of any waste treatment. 116,000 pounds of farm animal excrement is produced every second in the United States alone. That is enough waste per year to cover every square foot of San Francisco, New York City, Tokyo, Paris, New Delhi, Berlin, Hong Kong, London, Rio de Janeiro, Delaware, Bali, Costa Rica, and Denmark combined. Livestock operations on land has caused more than five, or created more than 500 nitrogen flooded dead zones around the world in our oceans, comprise more than 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of life. So any meaningful discussion about the state of our oceans has to always begin by frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture. The UN reported that three quarters of the world's fisheries are overexploited, fully exploited, or significantly depleted due to overfishing. The oceans are under siege like never before, and um, marine environments are in trouble. And if we don't wake up and do something about it, um, we're going to see fishless oceans by the year 2048. That's the prediction from scientists. The fact that when people look at fishing sometimes, they're only looking at the fact of the animals who are actually consumed by humans, and we're not necessarily looking at all the animals who are caught in the drift nets, all the other animals who are killed um, in the industry. We're at over 28 billion animals were pulled out of the ocean last year. 
they're not ever given a chance to recover. They can't recover. They don't multiply that quickly. They don't, you know, they don't come back. We're not giving them an opportunity. The way fishing is done today to feed the demand for 90 million tons of fish is primarily through massive fish nets. For every single pound of fish caught, there's up to five pounds of untargeted species trapped, such as dolphins, whales, sea turtles, and sharks, known as bikehill. If we were to imagine this same sort of practice happening on the African savanna, targeting gazelle, but in the process scooping up every single lion, giraffe, ostrich, and elephant, nobody would stand for it. Yet, this is what is happening in our oceans every single day. Between 40 and 50 million sharks each year are killed in fishing lines and fishing nets as bykill. Then their fins might be cut off or not cut off, but they're caught in initially as bykill. And it's from fishing. Fishing of any type is, is depleting not only the species, but you get into this serial depletion where one fish species will be minimized and the fishing industry uh, for that fishery will move on to the next species. And it's, it's called serial depletion, it's aptly named. And in the process, so the fish are being lost, not only, not only the species is being lost, but the next in line is being lost and then the mechanism is still extremely destructive. So they're losing the fish species, but it needs to be kept in mind they're also destroying habitat. It's Sea Shepherd's position that there is no such thing as sustainable fishing. Seafood is not a protein source for, uh, a sustainable protein source for the, for the uh, feeding of the planet, of the people on the planet, it's just not. Our founder, Captain Watson, likes to say, if the oceans die, we die. That's not a tagline, that's the truth. Perhaps the only other ecosystem that is being destroyed at such a rapid rate are the world's rainforests. Our global rainforests are essentially the planet's lungs. They breathe in CO2 and exhale oxygen. An acre of rainforest is cleared every second, and the leading cause is to graze animals and grow their feed crops. That is essentially an entire football field cleared every single second. And it is estimated that every day, Close to 100 plant, animal, and insect species are lost due to rainforest destruction. Palm oil plantations are causing tremendous deforestation in the Indonesian rainforest. It is estimated that palm oil is responsible for 26 million acres being cleared, though Compared to livestock and their feed crops, they were responsible for 136 million acres of rainforest lost to date. Unfortunately, one of the biggest causes of deforestation, um, definitely in the Brazilian Amazon, is agribusiness, cattle, cattle grazing, and soy production in particular. I found the Markegard grass-fed beef farm on the lush, misty California coast. All together, we graze about 4,500 acres. Wow. And uh, this is our home ranch. And this is uh, 952 acres of that. On average, it's about one cow or a cow and a calf per every 10 acres. We would produce annually roughly 80,000 pounds of finished plate-ready meat. We keep about 10 pigs in a roughly a 50-acre area, and we move them around in 10-acre pastures. With the land use, there's anywhere between, with, with industrial, as low as 2 to 2.5 acres per um, cow all the way up to some, depending, it's not as lush as this, up to 35 acres. Yeah, we have a ranch in South Dakota that's 50 acres. 50 acres <laughs> Yeah, it's about 50 acres, yeah. Is it possible, and is it practical for the whole world to, say, grow, have grass-fed cattle? And like, say, Brazil, where, you know, 80%, supposedly 80% of the, the rainforest was destroyed for, for cattle. Um, what are your thoughts on that? They shouldn't be eating beef. <laughs> if their environment wasn't designed to raise beef, then they shouldn't be eating it. Yeah. How do you offset the carbon footprint of livestock? Uh, we 
don't feel like livestock have a carbon footprint. I left there feeling confused. And as far as grass-fed beef not having a carbon footprint, it actually sounded like it could make sense until I added up the numbers on land use and population. If we were to use the market guard model of raising animals, which requires 4,500 acres producing 80,000 pounds of meat, the average American eats 209 pounds of meat per year. If that was all grass-fed beef, only 382 people could be fed on their land. That equates to 11.7 acres per person times 314 million Americans, which equals 3.7 billion acres of grazing land. Unfortunately, there are only 1.9 billion acres in the U.S.'s lower 48 states. Currently, nearly half of all United States land is already dedicated to animal agriculture. If we were to switch over to grass-fed beef, it would require clearing every square inch of the United States, up into Canada, all of Central America, and well into South America. And this is just to feed the United States' demand on meat. But that figure doesn't even take into consideration that much of that land isn't suited to graze livestock. We would have to convert all mountain ranges to grassland, clear ancient forests and national parks to grazing, and demolish every city just to make room to graze cows. Just like Brazil, the United States isn't suited to meet the demands for meat. It takes 23 months for a grass-fed animal to grow to the point to the size and age that it's slaughtered, whereas a grain-fed takes 15 months. So that's an additional eight months of water use, land use, feed, waste. And in terms of a carbon footprint, it's a huge difference. Turns out, due to land use, grass-fed beef is more unsustainable than even factory farming. I did want to talk with our premier organic dairy company to see if they believe their product was sustainable for the world's population. It requires a, a lot of inputs to produce milk. The feed, the water, the land, um, it does. And it, it may not be practical to expect that there can be enough dairy production produced in a sustainable way to, to feed the entire world. I just don't think that um, that's necessarily a given. I think it's maybe too, too much to expect that the world can be fed with dairy um, in a sustainable way. I don't know the answer, but common sense would say uh, that's, that's a long shot. I was shocked to hear such an honest answer. If this is what the dairy CEO would say, I wonder what the farmer would claim. Typically a cow will eat you know, 140 to 150 pounds of feed a day. 40 to 50 pounds of feed every day. And then she's also going to drink between 30 and 40 gallons of water. Probably go through about probably 20 tons per week. 20 tons of grain per week. Primarily for our milking cows, so about 250 cows. There's very few places on this planet that have this type of environment. But the demand on dairy-based protein in the world is only going to increase and there's not enough land on the planet to do this type of dairying um, around the world. It, it's just the uh, environment is not going to be that way. The land's not there. So on a, I guess on a global scale, a conclusion would be dairy is not sustainable. Unless we start digging up houses and putting pastures back. <laughs> and the only way to start digging up houses and development is to have less people. But we all we only know that you know, the population is going to continue to grow. Um, so that means more commercial dairying, I'm sure. Either that or some lower demand by the people. Yeah, or some other product's going to take its place. He was right. How could cow's milk be sustainable? For when one gallon of milk, it takes upwards of a thousand gallons of water to produce. Almost a third of the planet's land is becoming desert, with a vast majority due to livestock grazing. Doing research on grass-fed livestock, I kept coming across the work of Alan Savory. Savory claims that the best way to reverse this desertification is to actually graze more animals. This reminded me of Oceana saying the best way to help fish is to eat fish. This is the same man during the 1950s working as a research officer for the game department of what is now Zimbabwe, came up with a theory that actually elephants were the cause of desertification there. And his solution was convincing the government to kill 40,000 elephants. It turns out the cattle industry is having the same effect on wildlife in the United States. The government has been rounding up horses in mass, and we now have more wild horses and burrows in government holding facility. 50,000 wild horses from burrows in government holding facilities than we have free on the range. Basically, you have ranchers who get to graze on our public lands 
for a fraction of the going rate. So they're getting like this huge tax subsidy that's about one fifteenth of the going rate. And what the Bureau of Land Management has to do is say how much forage and water is on the land. And then they divvy it up. They give so much to the cows, so much to you know, wildlife, and so much to the wild horses and burros. And what we see is the lion's share of the forage and water is going to the livestock industry. And then they scapegoat the horses and burros and say, oh, there are too many horses and burros, let's remove them. I always tell people that wild horses and burros are just one of the victims of the management of our public lands for livestock because we also see the predator killing going on. We know wolves are now being targeted by ranchers to get rid of wolves. Uh, USDA has aircraft and all they do is aerial gunning of predators. So all a rancher does is call up and say, I've got a coyote here. They'll come over and they'll shoot the coyote or they'll shoot the mountain lion or they'll shoot the bobcat. And this is all for ranching. In Washington state, after cattle were found to be attacked on public lands where they were grazing under permit, Washington State de decided to um, kill the entire wedge pack of wolves. And those wolves were not introduced. They had in-migrated from Canada, but they're no longer there. And it starts at the local level with the Bureau of Land Management, but then it goes all the way to Congress. And we see Congress you know, sitting there willing to allow this type of mismanagement of our public lands to continue. It is the insistence of and the lobbying power of the animal agriculture industry that continues to see wolves killed, continues to see an insistence that predators be maintained at a low level that does not benefit ecosystems. I've seen so many pieces of land, I've looked at so many environmental assessments from the Bureau of Land Management where they say the rangelands are not meeting standards. And they say straight up, livestock grazing is a cause for not meeting range standards, and yet they will continue to allow livestock grazing. They're at the very core of making sure that cougars are treed by hounds and that wolf packs are run down and that hunting seasons are opened up year round and that traps are set so that they can suffer. If anyone cares about wild horses and wildlife and public lands and the environment, you can't ignore the livestock, the impact, the negative impact that livestock grazing is having on our public lands and the rest. I've added up the costs of animal food production that the producers don't actually bear themselves. These are the hidden costs or the externalized costs that they impose on society. And those are in categories like health care, environmental damage, subsidies, damage to fisheries, uh, and even cruelty. If you take those externalized costs, which are about $414 billion, if, if the meat and dairy industries were re required to internalize those costs, if they had to bear those costs themselves, the costs of the retail prices of meat and dairy would skyrocket. So uh, a $5 carton of eggs would go to $13. A $4 Big Mac would go to $11. Whether you eat meat or not, whether you're an omnivore or an herbivore, you are paying part of the costs of somebody else's consumption. So that when somebody goes into a McDonald's and buys a Big Mac for $4, there's another $7 of costs that's imposed on society. I'm paying that. You're paying that, whether you eat meat or not. When you really look at who's benefiting and who's lobbied for this system of agriculture, it's the largest uh, food producers in the country and the largest meat producers. And once they become so large and wealthy, then they can dictate the federal policies around producing food. The animal agriculture industry is one of the most powerful industries on the planet. I think most people in this country are aware of the influence of money and industry on politics, and we really see that clearly on display with this industry in particular. Most people would be shocked to learn that animal rights and environmental activists are the number one domestic terrorism threat, according to the FBI. And why is that? It's a difficult question to answer, why these groups are at the top of the FBI's priorities. I think a big part of it is that they, more than really any other social movements today, are directly threatening corporate profits. You know, when we try to find out how factory farms and how animal agriculture is polluting the environment, they try to claim exemptions to that information, either under national security terms or public safety, uh, trademark issues, business. Uh, it's a business secret. We've seen all these attempts to keep people in the dark about what they're actually doing. 
in one of the largest industries on the planet with the biggest environmental impact, trying to keep us in the dark about how it's operating. Some people would say the problem isn't really animal agriculture, but actually human overpopulation. In 1812, there are 1 billion people on the planet. In 1912, there are 1.5 billion. Then, just 100 years later, our population exploded to 7 billion humans. This number is rightly given a great deal of attention, but an even more important figure when determining world population is the world's 70 billion farm animals humans raise. The human population drinks 5.2 billion gallons of water every day and eats 21 billion pounds of food. But just the world's 1.5 billion cows alone drink 45 billion gallons of water every day and eat 135 billion pounds of food. This isn't so much a human population issue, it's a human eating animals population issue. We have roughly a billion people starving every single day. Worldwide, 50% of the grain and legumes that we're growing we're feeding to animals. So they're eating huge amounts of grain and legumes. And in the United States, it's more like closer to 70, 80, depending on which grain it is, 90, about 90% of the soybeans. 82% of the world's starving children live in countries where food is fed to animals in the livestock systems that are then killed and eaten by more well-off individuals in developed countries such as the US, UK, and in Europe. The fact of it is that we could feed every human being on the planet today an adequate diet if we did no more than take the, the feed that we are feeding to animals and actually turn it into food for humans. And so somebody trying to justify GMOs uh, that's like trying to give a drowning man a drink of water. You can produce, on average, 15 times more protein from plant-based sources than from meat on any given area of land, whether it's uh, uh, using the same type of land, whether it's a very fertile area in one area of the world or it's an area that's depleted. If we would reduce the amount of meat we're eating and dairy and eggs, we could allow all these monocropped fields of genetically engineered corn and soybeans to revert back to forest again, to be habitat for animals. You know, anytime somebody tells you that we can't grow food for humans on the land that we're growing feed for animals, uh, this is somebody that is smoking the number one crop out of California. The, the fact of it is, if you can grow corn to stuff down the throat of an animal, you can actually grow corn and feed it to a human. Um, you encourage people to eat less meat and for the tremendous resources required and the toll on the environment. And on the animals. And on the animals. And the workers in the system. And it's a brutal system at every level. As the world population continues to grow to almost 9 billion people, do you foresee someday that we might just completely have to stop eating meat altogether? I don't know that we'll completely stop. I think that the amount of meat eaten will decline. I, 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 there's no way to support nine ounces per person per day, which is what Americans are eating now. Um, if the Chinese alone decide they want to eat that much, and they've decided they want to eat that much, there's an, you know, we just can't. We don't have enough world uh, to produce the grain to, to generate that much meat. Um, I think we, you know, a plant-based diet is, is the most sustainable. But what do you recommend see for 9 billion people can eat for the planet to not only sustain but to thrive? Would you throw out a number, like a, an ounce, one ounce? Oh, uh, per meat? And including dairy, like... Yeah, I, I, I don't think I, I, I don't know enough. Um, but yeah, it would be on the order of a couple ounces a week, you know. It's not going to be... Uh, the way we're eating it now. We're gorging on meat. We're eating huge amounts. And does that include cheese too? Like yeah, two yeah. Ounces total? Yeah, two, cheese you know, and milk. Two and ounces a week. Only two ounces a week seemed like nothing. People could probably raise that in their own backyard. Maybe backyard farming was a sustainable solution. I have 42 ducks. I started off with three ducks three years ago, and then those uh, burdened into a population. I buy a 75 pound bag of seed. That seed bag will last me right now about two weeks. The ducks now uh, that we're gonna be culling are about two years old. When you're living with them, they get used to you. You know, they don't, or they're not intimidated or whatever, and, and so they make all their vocal sounds like natural. Go down. Easy, 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 easy. Okay. 
No, we're gonna keep you. Run. Not the fingers. I just can't do it. I don't think I could. I don't think I could have someone else do it for me. If I can't do it, if I can't do it, I don't want someone else doing it for me. And then sustainability for saying sustainability, 75 pounds is two pounds per. So it's a pound per week per duck. Uh, 52 weeks, 110. So it's 110 pounds of food for one to one and a half pound of meat. So on a sustainability issue, it's 100 to one. And that grain gets, you know, who knows where that grain comes from. But I mean, when it gets to this point, it's not even about sustainability. It was, uh, it was just, uh, you know, I don't feel real good inside. It's the first time I've ever seen that. So, kind of, yeah. I had already scheduled weeks in advance to film another backyard slaughter of a chicken that stopped producing eggs. I didn't know how it was going to possibly go through another slaughter. So I didn't. Animal Place is a farm animal sanctuary in Northern California that focuses on rescuing animals from the animal agriculture industry. A lot of people don't realize that uh, meat breed chickens, like this guy behind us, um, they're generally slaughtered at about 42 days old, um, whereas uh, chickens that are bred for egg production are killed when, they're, when their productivity starts to decrease, when, when they start laying less eggs. Um, Oh. And that generally happens about um, 18 months to, to 20 months. It, it doesn't matter if you buy caged eggs, eggs from hens on cage-free farms or free-range farms or pasture-based farms. Hi, Carol. Um, it doesn't matter. It turns out there's a successful movement of sustainable animal alternative food producers based right here in California, funded by big names like Bill Gates and Biz Stone. When you imagine all those egg-laying hens eating all that soy and all that corn, you have an energy conversion ratio at about 38 to 1. Whereas alternatively, you can find plants. And you can grow those plants, and you can convert those plants into food. And the energy conversion ratio for the plants that we're using to replace the eggs is about 2 to 1, compared to 38 to 1 for eggs. Mm. So our explicit goal is to have the maximum amount of impact by creating this new model that makes the global egg industry entirely obsolete. We're making the Omega products and proving that we can make better tasting food that's great for you and it takes 1 20th of the land and resources that dairy do. If I could tell you that you could have the fiber structure of meat, the satiating bite of meat, the protein and all the nutritional benefits of meat without actually having animal protein itself. And by doing that, you could address climate change. You could address the human health epidemics that we're seeing. You could address animal welfare, and you could address natural resource conservation. Would you make the change? But what if people just ate less animal products, like going meatless on Mondays? When you go meatless on Monday, if you ascribe to that campaign, you're essentially contributing to climate change, pollution, depletion of our planet's resources, and your own health, then on only six days of the week, instead of seven. Uh, you're creating a false justification clearly a false sense of uh, justification for what you're doing on those other six days of the week. So in other words, you know, we really shouldn't be resting on our laurels of what you do right uh, only one-seventh of the time. You can't be an environmentalist and eat animal products, period. I had doubts about being healthy and not eating meat, dairy, and eggs. All I knew was a standard American diet I grew up on. Um, is it even possible to be a healthy vegetarian or vegan? Is it possible to be a healthy vegetarian or vegan? Uh, I became vegan for, let's see, 32 years ago now. And uh, I run several miles every day. I, I go biking 40, 50 miles through the countryside. I work long hours. Um, I feel great. It's nice waking up in a light, trim body every day. 
And so many of my vegan friends and patients, you know, are just, you know, they're thriving as since their transition to a vegan diet. So yes, and I've seen vegan moms go through healthy vegan pregnancies and deliver healthy vegan children and raise them to tall, full-size, intelligent vegan adults. And yes, um, it, certainly all, all the nutrients are there in the plant kingdom to do this. That, that is correct. Think anyone should be uh, consuming dairy? I really don't. Uh, when you think about it, the purpose of cow's milk, I did most of my growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. The purpose of cow's milk is to turn a 65 pound calf into a 400 pound cow as rapidly as possible. Cow's milk is baby calf growth fluid. That's what this stuff is. <clears throat> Everything in that white liquid the hormones, the lipids, the proteins, the sodium, the growth factors, the IGF, all, every one of those is meant to blow that calf up to a great big cow. It wouldn't be there. The cow's milk is the lactation secretions of a large bovine mammal who just had a baby. You know, I tell my patients, go look in the mirror. Do you have big ears? Do you have a tail? Are you a baby calf? If you're not, don't be eating baby calf growth fluid in, uh, in any level. There's nothing in it people need. It was a relief to hear I didn't have to eat any animal products to be healthy and even thrive, but I still thought you needed animal manure to grow organic agriculture. I visited Earthworks Urban Farm in Detroit, where they are working with and growing food for the low-income community. We tend to see ourselves in, uh, as individuals in a bubble but, and forget that we inhabit this, this land and this earth with other creatures. So we have to learn how to, to share more, I guess. The one full year after we, this was constructed, uh, we doubled our yield to over 14,000 pounds of food. 14,000 pounds on yeah. how many, about how many acres? Uh, about two and a half. So as much food as we produce and we grow, or the earth helps us grow, is we also have to return those nutrients back to the soil. So we like to think of our work as being regenerative, that we're putting us as much um, life-giving substance in the ground as we're, as we're taking out. So it's just kind of healthier and safer to use vegetarian or vegetable composting and stuff? Yeah, that's what we found. But also because it takes less time, it's a lot easier to manage. A lot easier, yeah. Yeah. And the soil is just as rich. No. Yeah, absolutely. Not only is it veganic more compassionate, it's also more efficient. And, and in a society with this many billions of people, we, we need to be as efficient as possible. Some people might go back and say, if we embrace this, this primitive approach of only wild animals everywhere, and we go back to like a hunter-gatherer system, that sounds great. But that was 10 million people on the entire continent. Today, now, we have what? We have 320 million in the US, 25 million in Canada, another 100 and so many million in Mexico. So North America, is up to almost uh, you know 450 million people trying to figure out a way to, to bring animal agriculture in balance with 450 hungry million hungry people is impossible this is amazing i didn't believe it when i first learned it but 216,000 more people are born to the planet every day every day it's extraordinary but what's really extraordinary is you need per day, 34,000 new acres of farmable land. It's not happening. To feed a person on an all plant-based vegan diet for a year requires just one sixth of an acre of land. To feed that same person on a vegetarian diet that includes eggs and dairy requires three times as much land. To feed an average US citizen's high consumption diet of meat, dairy, and eggs requires 18 times as much land. This is because you can produce 37,000 pounds of vegetables on one and a half acres but only 375 pounds of meat on that same plot of land. A high-consuming meat-eating Californian saves 1.4 tons of CO2 equivalent per year by removing beef from their diet. They save 1.6 tons by going vegetarian and 1.8 tons by going vegan. This is more than switching to solar power for your home or driving a hybrid car. The savings don't end with greenhouse gases. A vegan diet produces half as much CO2 as an American omnivore, uses 1 11th the amount of fossil fuels, 1 13th the amount of water, and an 18th of the amount of land. After adding this all up, I realized I had the choice every single day to save over 1,100 gallons of water, 45 pounds of grain, 30 square feet of forested land, the equivalent of 10 pounds of CO2, and one animal's life every single day. If we all as a society did go vegan 
and we moved away from eating animal foods and toward a plant-based diet, well, what would happen? If we didn't kill all these cows and eat them, then we wouldn't have to breed all these cows because they're because we're breeding cows and chickens and pigs and fishes. We're breeding them and you know over and over again relentlessly. So if we didn't breed them, then we wouldn't have to feed them. If we didn't have to feed them, then we wouldn't have to devote all this land to growing grains and legumes and so forth to feed to them. And so the, then the forest could come back, uh, wildlife could come back. The oceans would come back, the rivers would run clean again, the air would come back, a health would return. Renewable energy infrastructure, such as building solar and wind generators all over our country to reduce climate change, I mean, that's, that's a pretty good idea, but it's projected to take at least 20 years and at least minimally $18 trillion to develop. Another solution to climate change, we could, we could stop eating animals, and it could be done today. It doesn't have to take. Uh, 20 years and it certainly doesn't have to take 18 trillion dollars because it costs nothing. Some people say well let's fix CO2 and then we can worry about the methane. Well that's the wrong, it's the other way around. It actually makes sense. Do something about methane because you get a response right away. Quietly and unmistakably the most powerful thing that someone can do for the environment. Um, no other lifestyle choice has a farther reaching and more profoundly positive impact on the planet and all life on earth than choosing to, to stop consuming animals and live a vegan lifestyle. You don't think we couldn't solve this problem in a heartbeat? I'll tell you what, all we would need is for the environmentalists to live what they profess, and we'd be on a new course in the world. We will not succeed until we stop animal agriculture. And by succeed, I mean we will not save ecosystems to the extent necessary. We will not have enough food for people around the planet. We will not stop global warming. We will not stop pollution and the dead zones that run off all the fields of corn and soy that are grown to feed livestock. And we will not stop the, the hunting of wolves and other predators. Now, organic farming is one major positive step in the right direction, but we need to keep walking. We need to get beyond organics. We need to get to sustainability. When you take the animal out, well, you also take the greenhouse gas issue out. And you take the food safety issues out. And you take some of the other externalities related to food scarcity out. But one thing that's amazing is, I think you put our values back in. You put values like compassion and integrity and kindness, values that are natural to human beings. You put that in. You build that back into the story of our food. And I think as this begins to progress, I think it also helps people to pause before they eat that egg, before they eat that steak, before they eat that chicken nugget, and ask themselves, is that really what they want? Or do they actually want something more? I had to come to the full conclusion, the only way to sustainably and ethically live on this planet with 7 billion other people is to live an entirely plant-based vegan diet. I decided instead of eating others, to eat for others. At first, like these environmental groups, I was afraid of what it'd mean to change, but now I embrace it. All this talk about sustainability sounded like our planet was on some sort of life support, and I don't want her to simply survive or to sustain, but to thrive. Life today is not about sustainability, it's about thriveability. She's given so much to us for so long, it was time to give back. 108% of everything we have. It felt good. It was in alignment. And we see this movement not just about providing cheaper and expensive food that everyone can have, but also a spiritual move, a move towards understanding who we really are and how we can really connect to each other. Do what you can do as well as you can do it every day of your life, and you will end up dying one of the happiest individuals that ever, ever died we become part of a gathering momentum of other people that's happening. This is really what's happening. This is the news. Selflessness is a nice way to be. It has all these benefits for yourself as well as the planet and other people. So it's, it's a beautiful way to live. Ecologically, it's just, it just feels better. This is about massively transforming how our society eats because it's a necessity. It's acting on what we know and acting kindly and gently on the whole planet and with other people to accomplish the goals of living better. 
We can do it, but we have to choose to do it. You can change the world. You must change the world. Thank you.